should uh, I think we should start. Um, it's a real pleasure to welcome Professor Friedrich Kittler uh, to the AA. I don't think he's been here uh, to lecture uh, at the AA, certainly. Um, and we really uh, welcome him. His work is, is now beginning to sort of, I think, grow in the sort of momentum with which it's recognized uh, in the English-speaking world. Um, although, of course, with the kind of lapse of time taken by, tra by translation, uh, it's still, in a sense, the, the earlier Kittler, uh, which we have to read. I remember myself, four or five years ago, um, someone <clears throat> recommending reading the text, which I think had just come out, uh, entitled, uh, I'm going to get the, the, the series wrong, but Gramophone Moving Image Typewriter. Um, and saw there this kind of remarkable analysis of the relationship between these technologies uh, and their differential kind of effects and relations uh, to subjectivity. It was very remarkable, I think, for someone in an Anglo-American context to see some of the themes um, which had initially found provisional formulation in Marshall McLuhan kind of reworked. I, I think McLuhan probably uh, in America and England was thought to be kind of dead at least for a good while before he'd come back. In some sense it struck me actually reading the book um, that many of the analyses stemmed perhaps not so much from Marshall McLuhan, uh, but in some sense from his mentor, uh, Walter Ong, um, who, who worked for a long time on the introduction and the effects of the introduction of writing um, as perhaps one of the fundamental uh, technological changes in the West. And the, uh, that had spawned an enormous and, and vast literature uh, at one stage uh, in which really there was a point at which in America and, and in Britain not only did this have decisive effects on Homer scholarship uh, but really kind of decisive effects on the role in which the technology of writing played for example in determining the forms and to some extent the content uh, of, of Greek philosophy. Um, and it's extremely interesting to see that form of analysis uh, transferred and kind of extended um, into modernity. I understand that Professor Kittler uh, is now working uh, kind of on the history uh, of music in its relation to this, uh, these questions, and it would be extremely, we look forward very much um, to seeing that. Uh, he teaches uh, as professor <coughs> at the Humboldt University in Berlin. Um, and I think his work is, as I say, increasingly recognized in an Anglo-American context. I don't quite know uh, uh, all the materials which he's published in respect to architecture, but some of you may have already seen uh, the article on essentially computer graphics. Uh, which was published, I think, a couple of years ago in the American journal, The Grey Room. I think it's kind of number two. Anyway, I hope you'll join with me in welcoming Professor Kittler. I turn it on again. Thank, thank you so much for your kind introduction. And ladies and gentlemen, as, as I understood in, in this invitation, I'm supposed to talk upon microarchitectures. To translate it into a more Lon London way of thought, we could call this little lecture Gulliver's Travels, part five because we have now to go into this dwarfish world of microprocessing. 
And I, I must confess uh, this invitation, despite my poor English, which is heavily Americanized, um, uh, came to me both as a joy and as a surprise. As a surprise because I'm professionally concerned neither with architecture nor with the history of art, notwithstanding my interest in all these issues as an amateur. And it came as a joy because the metaphor or the imagery taken from architecture, from city planning and infrastructure design is among the most prominent, I must say, among even the most ubiquitous uh, metaphors in chip manufacturing these days. Layout, design, architecture, chip architecture, these are the very words that the engineers use. And so I hope it makes good, good sense to study these deeply rooted analogies between your professional skills arising or arose, uh, professional skills on one hand and that of the engineers who are in train of changing our very world. We are totally unable to, uh, to estimate, to log on the donor, to really understand how, how far and how deep and how mighty and how powerful in war and in peace this uh, underlying structure of computing uh, influences our way of not only living but thinking. And this is, I think, the first pu public lecture I give uh, based on, a, on my Linux system because the printer wouldn't come to London with me. And mm, uh, this allusion to, to my bad English uh, is hopefully counterbalanced by the fact, fact that all these uh, chip engineers, lucky enough for me, happen to speak a worldwide pitch in English so that even I, as a German, learned every uh, technical term in English uh, form. Now comes the real problem. This crazy world of modern Gulliver is per definition difficult to imagine. Its dimensions are given nowadays in measures of nanometers and nanoseconds. You may know that the Greek word nano literally means dwarfish and stands in modern engineering standards for the for a one thousand millionth part, part of a meter or of a second, <coughs> mathematically put it, uh, for 10 power minus 9. And uh, given these difficulties of imaging and representing this unsinkably small world, I will start, even though no historian of architecture, by making some introductory historical and macroscopic, macroscopic remark, uh, remarks in order to re recall to you, you know it better, some basic features of architectural and city design. The idea is to start with, with big scale uh, systems in, in, the, in prehistory and history and then come to this dimension of one male, one man's some male, as is, as it is today. You are, all of you know that houses and cities are precisely as old as the Neolithic Revolution, which started rather suddenly, just 12 millennia ago, in the in the Near East, so actual and so imminent. Nomads, as we still fear them, think of actual Afghanistan or German settled peacefully down and became, thanks to villages and towns, our more or less peaceful predecessors. Think of Jericho, of Babylon, or of Tebai Hecatompylos, as Homer put it, the Egyptian capital adorned with 100 city gates, Hecatompylos. And these days, world history has an obvious tendency to always come back 
as if in mathematical recursion to the same old places as we will see next week during the next Babylonian War. So whether not now or 7,000 years ago, the issue is the same and has been called by a brilliant heretic Marxist named Karl Otto Wittfogel, I think he lived in London or New York, uh, has been called the Oriental Despoty. And this is to say that the first big cities such as Assur or Babylon or Thebai, Egyptian Theban, must be conceived not so much as isolated early artworks, but in strict correlation with their geographical and agricultural environment. Mighty rivers such, such as the Euphrat, the Tigris, the Nile, flowing in the midst of otherwise infertile deserts, provided and provide the scarce commodity of fresh water as it is absolutely needed by cereals, by domestic animals and human populations. So, following Wittfogel, Oriental despots, whether priests or kings, were, were mainly occupied by building up a um, hydraulic infrastructure by means of this fresh water and by procuring, maintaining and distributing this water as the input of the system and food and other goods as the output, output of the same, very same system. And now there comes probably a little bit, a little deception I made myself and anticipated for you. Being students of architecture, you're probably more interested in building nice or even beautiful houses than in designing a prosaic intra infrastructure made up of thousands of water channels. In order to approach the secrets of microarchitecture, however, you will have to reorient your thoughts from the inside to the outside that is towards the hidden beauty of such large-scale infrastructures. What's inside the house, what's inside the transistor, what's inside the flip-flop doesn't count nowadays. And since the most elementary metaphor for invisible electricity is and remains the water flow passing through rivers and brooks, this hydraulic oriental economies of the ancient Near East of a wonderful mo model for our actual visualization of electrical currents, resistances, and potentials. Just for one instance or example, in the case of so-called field effect transistors, which are the most basic element of every actual computer chip, one external connection is called, still called the source, another uh, external connection is called the train, the deepest point, while, it, while the third connection, the so-called gate, is an explicit control of the momentary flow of electrons or electron holes when they make their way from source to drain, from a higher potential to a lower one. This is, it's, it's, it's very easy for you to imagine this as, as architect. Another, yet no better model of modern electronics would be the flow of car traffic through some metropolitan street. So for instance, during World War II, a later on famous French anthropologist was compelled by Germans to seek asylum in New York, or more precisely, in Manhattan. There, Claude Lévi-Strauss happened to live in the same skyscraper as another famous Claude, at least in my ears famous Claude, I mean the mathematician and engineer and computer pioneer Claude Elwood Shannon, who at the same time was working for American Telephone and Telegraph Company, better known as AT&T and Bell Labs. Both Claudes made acquaintance each other and looked down from their skyscraper floor uh, down to the traffic going on in Manhattan during World War II. And as Lévi-Strauss put it later, uh, in his former Paris years, he had misunderstood car traffic as a rather individual affair, every Parisian doing what he, what, what he liked or the others disliked. But looking down at the car flow in Manhattan, 
and with the intellectual help of Claude Shannon, uh, Lady Strauss realized that you can easily mm, see in this car flow some macroscopic instantiation of microscopic or molecular movements such as water drops or gas molecules or ga gas molecules or what have you uh, with the theoretical result that traffic can be mathematically formalized as some kind of Boltzmann equations, a statistical Boltzmann equation system. And this was one of the inspiring moments uh, in the mind of Claude Lévy-Strauss to, to term uh, traditional description systems in anthropology into structuralist ones. I want to be grateful to my forefather. The same uh, Manhattan infrastructure offers yet another good model for a better understanding of actual microarchitecture. As you know, there is in Manhattan, except the famous and originally Indian Broadway, simply no way to shorten up your way by feet or by car uh, by diagonalizing it as we all, as every European likes to do, go diagonally, if possible, over, over, over places and uh, small streets. In Manhattan, on the other side, all streets cross each other in, at right angles, and so the, this, and this so-called Manhattan block architecture introduces you to some of the outstanding features of chip uh, layout, the simple orthogonality of most internal channels or wires. In this regard, microarchitecture calls back what in the history of architecture has been, seems to have been a major Greek exploit. The general formula Pythagoras, Pythagoras law states for rectilingua, rectiangular triangles. A power two plus B power two gives C power two and so on. Um, to recall one famous Greek architect, Hippodamus of, Mil of, Milet, of Miletos, the first European city planner as far as I can tell, uh, was born about 480 before Jesus Christ in the old Ionian city of Miletos on the Persian, of the borders of the Persian Empire. In his Old hometown, however, grown structures and street layouts hindered his geometric or Pythagorean mind. So about uh, 440 before our time, uh, Miletus joined uh, colonial ship, uh, many colonial ships going from Athens and other places uh, to southern Italy, where the founding fathers uh, had just decided to build up a totally new colony named Turioi. And this Turioi, this was a will of Pericles of Athens, uh, should be built at the very place of the famous, uh, of the ill-famed uh, because of its uh, luxuriant uh, city of Sybaris, Cibar which probably is still to you uh, proverbial for sex and enjoy. <laughs> and so Sybaris had, had been so totally destroyed by its enemies that it was a totally deserted and destroyed plain and Hippodamus could do what he wanted and would, what he couldn't have done at his home place in Ionia. <coughs> and he got the chance to invent a totally new kind of city, the late Greek polis, um, as a perfect rectangular grid laid all over deserted coastal plains. This deed seems to have offered the model for later Hellenistic urbanism on a wide, on a empire-wide scale and the model for Roman military castles and then finally in actual computer design for this American vice of modularization as Thomas Pynchon did label it in his wonderful novel Gravity's Rainbow. 
modularization in a sense presupposes uh, rectangular or vex vex like uh, be vex like uh, elements. And having arrived at Thomas Pynchon, I take just I just take another novel out of his wonderful work and in doing so will stop will, will end my introductory remarks. This other novel is uh, a very small one, The Crying of Lot 49, and there the, at the beginning and, and, and at the end of the story, the heroine is looking down from her car at a, at a rather artific artificial, newly built Californian middle class town, which not by chance bears the Christianized name of a mythical Greek hero. I mean the name San Narciso. San is Christian and Narciso is not Christian at all. And this is the same totally or perfect rectangular grid shows up again when she looks down and it makes her, it makes her wonder at first and only at second sight the heroine, Oedipa Maas, recalls the moment when she, earlier in life, in order to su supply fresh batteries, first opened her tiny transistor radio and put into it the batteries, the electricals. And then she discovered that the whole transistor radio consisted on the back side out of uh, a printed circuit. And this printed circuit, early 50s, last century, held together all the electronic parts in the, constituting this radio. <coughs> so you, I, I invite you to take this, this, uh, this heroine's discovery of a hidden structure that underlied all, at the same time a city and a technical device, a macroscopic and a rather mi microscopic system, as an allegory of our modern narcissism under whose, under whose narcosis, as Marshall Mellon has stressed, narcissus and narcosis stem from the same Greek word, uh, under whose narcosis we normally, if nothing exceptional does happen, keep on sleeping and dreaming. We are end users in the sense uh, Bill Gates likes. So without further delay and without reading anymore, I'll name you or introduce you into some elementary, elementary historical landmarks about when and how all this printed circuitry came into technical being. This short story will have four short parts or three parts and a zero um, beginning. The stage zero seems to have gone from the beginnings of electric bricolage in Edison's time uh, up to the beginning of World War II. In this ancient fabulous time, resistors, tubes, coils and uh, copper connections and so on uh, were freely and three dimensionally uh, in, in three dimensions uh, combined into radio sets or early television sets even. I, I still uh, I still am a historical sorry, I can testify to have seen and, 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 and touched uh, these crazy things but I swear you uh, the, the danger of uh, short circuits is everlasting in this primitive three dimensional design once uh, one copper wire meets another, it gives a short flash and then the radio has gone. So, uh, not by chance, uh, at the beginning of World War II, all implied uh, sites were most interested in assuring greater electric stability for above all in situations in, in airplanes or in submarines where, uh, where mobile noise, noise of, of shutter and, and, and movement itself uh, 
produce this uh, risk of failing systems. And on a very simple humanly level, let's speak of the dimension of inches, um, the printed circuit came into being. That is a plate with holes as you know it and everything thing is single uh, element, resistor, tube, coil and so on was soldered at both ends or three ends in the case of a tube uh, on this fixed uh, basis. And this was the first step, uh, not in technology or engineering at all, but in this special field of electronics uh, that in a way the diagram, the, function, the functional diagram and the actually functioning thing uh, approached each other more and more. But on, still on a visible level till in the next stage uh, the big dimensions of tubes and diodes were reduced by semiconductors, by semiconductors like silicon or, or, or germanium and other uh, more or less uh, ubiquitous elements in the chemical sense. The, the first small, that is miniaturized, uh, semi semiconductor was uh, was invented as a diode, two gates, uh, for in, in 1940 for military radar. Clumsy diodes could be replaced by very small uh, silicon pieces, but this was just the, the beginning and not the, the, the real game. The real game started immediately after the war, America had won, with the invention of the transistor, not, not two but three gates, the equivalent of the old electric tube which, in, which, which could take dimensions of half a meter. I think Christmas 1948, William Shockley, John Bardeen and Walter Brittain uh, got their first uh, transistor into their hands to say something, not, not just anecdotal, William Shockley all, all got the Nobel Prize, all three of them, and uh, William Shockley is the leading mind at, once again, at AT&T Bell Lab. Uh, during the war was the chief uh, scientific advisor in bombing that or not that town in Japan. This was his job to tell whether Hiroshima was a better target than Kyoto, let's say. And at, and at his end, in, as, as a professor of physics in Stanford University in my early days, he, uh, he proposed to castrate every male Negro. This was his in interesting end. And out of this, uh, but American Negro, to limit my, his proposal. <coughs> and out of this idea that a formerly uh, complex system of, of grid and anode and, 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 and cathode could be uh, put into something which was just in the dimension of one or two millimeters, meters, um, at the end of the 60s, last century, the next generation of American Pentagon finance guys uh, thought about the idea of the idea to integrate not just one uh, transistor element but many of them. Let's start with 10 and then with 100 and then 1000. And so the very idea of an integrated circuit came into the technical world. Fairchild, Texas Instruments were the first uh, rocket. Uh, rocket steering and controlling uh, industry, private industry uh, companies and as so often in technical history 
neither Fairchild nor Texas Instruments really realized what they'd done. And so it remained up to Royce and Gordon Moore when they founded Intel Corporation in Santa Clara to formulate what's it all about. You know Intel Corporation now has about 19% of the computer market worldwide. And, oh, oh, just a moment. Let's, 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 now we're, we're, we're writing 2003 and going back to 65, it, it, ma it makes one almost wonder or admire this Gordon Moore when he, co when he told, told people in cold blood uh, a mathematical law for the future growth of computer cap capacities and speed and power and many transistorizer the, the, the number of trans transistors in one in, in a unique uh, integrated circuit and he, he simply said uh, for the next generations and decades to come every 18 months the power and the speed and the complexity will double. And this has proven true empirically, not ontologically, up to this very day. And if we make a little mathematical uh, rearrangement of <coughs> Gordon Moore's law, as it's called in the, in, in the jargon, we, got a, we get a function like this. where x would be a year and 18 months would be 3 divided by 2 and this, these concrete numbers uh, you, could abs you could abstract to one instantiation of the general law of exponential growth and then you would have a function that is one at point x equals zero <coughs> and is e two seven one eight and so on at point x equals one and who, the function has started at minus infinity with zero and it will ar arrive at plus infinity in exponential time to an infinite simply to the magnitude of infinity and this for some people and for the economy of computer based uh, bulbs it sounds promising and for me it sounds terrifying in a sense and I'm coming back to this <coughs> Intel prophecy oracle <coughs> I followed, I personally followed all this development uh, up to, to the, la the late 80s when the many pins on all these integrated chips had distances from each other of about a tenth of an inch, 1.51 millimeter my clumsy fingers and hands and soldiering tools were able to handle this one year later the distance were half and, 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 and now we are in dimensions that are undescribable uh, tiny at the same time late 80s the industry almost skipped uh, digital chips and stepped over to a monopoly of discrete digital systems. Transistor didn't amplify anymore but simply switched off and on, zero and one. This took away every mm, mathematical elegance what made it possible was the Pentagon heavily sponsored 
under the name of very, scale, very large scale integration VLSEI. The strategical goal uh, behind very large scale integration has been has 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 been uh, the goal has been reached. That is the uh, empire of the of of, of the of the Soviet Union uh, imploded with a womp and not with a bang because they couldn't sim they, they simply couldn't follow the speed with. Uh, of the, of the American large-scale integration in the early 90s. The situation right now this year, you might, might know, is um, two to three hundred million transistor on one central processing unit, and no more, seven, seven, seven thousand million, and the number of one Amer American billion will soon be transgressed. This will be a great day in Silicon Valley. They enjoy <laughs> right now the, the moment when the first uh, company will cross this magical number border. But now what happens on all these uh, little transistors or flip-flops Flip-flops are digital units, elementary digital units, which in the very precise uh, thinking of Intel Corporation are made up uh, out of six transistors and in the, very, in, in the, in the much more risky th sort of Motorola con uh, competition, uh, simply four. And, and four are not so stable as six transistors. I say it to Macintosh user. <coughs> Um, now, what's, what's happening on all this sand cranes, as Archimedes of uh, Syracuse would probably ha have named it? Um, there are two strategical possibilities. The, one is th the first is fascinating, but seldom um, taken. As a hardware, hard, hardware provider, you would don't do nothing. You just make up uh, a billion of transistors and, and, and then they say to your consu consumer, do with all these transistors whatever you like. And this concept is called uh, offering an ocean of gates. This is an, an anarchic model and then application specific integrated circuits will come out of these sea or ocean of gates. But you can, in, in architectural terms, I must always think of this little uh, Minoan city in East Krita, Greek island, which is called Gornea, in which shows absolutely no structure. It, it, each little ruined house looks just uh, like another house and there are almost no streets between the houses and it's all accumulation and, you, and, and randomness and it's a, it's, it's a striking contrary of Knossos and Feistos where you have hierarchies and structures and inner, in, in, inner uh, outer and high and low and so on and many and, and so please believe me uh, the hierarchical model coming from Theban and Knossos and Pisos is still in power. And this, uh, I, like, I like very much uh, Lewis Mumford's uh, long-term speculation on the relation between nowadays structures and archaic structures. And when he talks about the oriental despotry, uh, Mumford stresses the fact that since uh, this neolithic Revolution: A city has, in, a city can be formalized to ju just three functions: palace or temple as a central unit, streets and other traffic ways, rivers also as a way of transmitting data, and houses and storehouses, warehouses as a way of storing people and data and information or what, what what else you have. And so the three functions of processing data or commanding 
of transmitting data or communicating and of storing, remembering, getting back as a fundamental threefold structure which for instance was inspiring when I, for me when I wrote a gramophone film typewriter. And you can put a desk pod in the palace or palace or priest. You can take officers and messengers to transmit information and you can put people into houses in order to um, in order that they don't become nomads. And precisely this is a, since early 1945 the structure of the so-called uh, John von Neumann architecture. When John von Neumann had the big job to think about the possibility to destroy probably the whole state of New Mexico by the first test, test, test explosion, he was he became keenly interested in simula simulation tools and pushed the development of the INIAC computer and gave us the first theoretical oversight over what a John von Neumann computer architecture had to be and so the division between central processing unit between buses as transformation flow lines, uh, information flow lines and, the, and, and storage was a fundamental one he implemented into our actual, still actual CPU and, and, and mother, motherboard design. You can look at the uh, processing elements as registers. You can look at all channels and wires and optical wires which are more and more, uh, which come more and more into being as, uh, as streets and you can think of all these different me uh, storage media from the RAM, the random access memory to the ROMs and, and hard disks and cache memories and so on as storage media. And generally I, I think every complete media system uh, necessarily and sufficiently implements these three functions. And so we, we in Coming back to Mumford, we we have really got we are really through this process of miniaturization in some millennia. But the structural problems are so totally separated from historical problems that the oldest issues of of, of city building or river crossing come up once again. The question of bridges, the question of crossroads, uh, crossroad, electrical crossroads are even more dangerous than human crossroads since the invention of, of high, highways and the uh, highways are, as you know, a way of, uh, a way of avoiding crossroads and meeting of people and separate uh, right-left uh, traffic is as, cru as crucial to modern uh, urbanism and, 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 and infrastructures as it is to plus and minus electricity flow. So in continuation of what I try to say, an actual computer design in theory as in practice is its own topological configuration and in this configuration the very intelligence of the system is, uh, is present. That is to say that the actual, uh, that, that the de development process, not just in car building or airplane construction, but in the most prominent case of developing new computer generations, is a twofold process where surely some leading engineers have some uh, strange new good ideas, usually not, in, 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 not the people in Intel Corporation but the professors of computer science Stanford University. Mm. And then uh, Intel engineers take this uh, that, uh, genial idea like RISC, uh, reduced instruction uh, set computers also, and put them into a very general architecture which, which then has to be realized 
with computer design, with computer aided design. No engineer is, is able to, uh, these days, to go into these famous gar garages in, uh, as, as uh, Steve Jobs uh, in, in, in mythology uh, has, has done it and draws down uh, 3,000 transistors on a very big sheet of paper and then these engineers go on and, and, and miniaturize this structure into this uh, two uh, centimeter power two child field. That is to say one level more abstractly that without this computer aided computer design Moore's law would long have broken down before us, before the time of my, of my talk. And only the combined efforts of uh, solid body physics and uh, miniaturizing the whole equipment of writing down microscopic structures on silicon and silicon dioxide uh, keeps Moore's law going. So you have to imagine a situation uh, where connections, streets, wires, copper wires for instance, uh, where streets or highways which search themselves an optimal path through England because no human engineer is able under given these complexes, complexity of connections to think them out. You, you, you can easily solve the traveling salesman problem for 10 cities. You can't do it as a human intelligence. Not, you, you are unable to do it for, for millions of thousands of, of, of transistors or flip flops. And this is the reason why engineers have distanciated them there more and more from this microarchitectural level and they deal not with materials anymore rather they have written for themselves huge software libraries into which the microscopical technical specifications of transistors will be laid down once and forever and then a computer program can take out these software libraries describing hardware components and put them together automatically and bring them into uh, re really existing end user chips by the intermediate mean of means of electrolithographical processes that burn these structures into the, the, the silicon vapors. So you understand from the point of view of the engineers of now, scaling down is an automized routine, something, something very simple, which in the ideal world of computer software could go on and on without meeting any limit. On, you can th think, please think of fractals of tiny Mandelbrot Apple images and their infinite scale independent recursion all, all over and over the system. But this is an illusion and I want to stress this point together with some physicists from Livermore Labs who really know what's at stake, I think. And they say that computers are physical and that is finite beings in a world of time and space bounded resources. Finite computers in a finite world can't be miniaturized uh, forever. And so limits are inbuilt into this whole project and they are easily foreseeable, the limits, and they are actually foreseen. I just got information about the roadmaps, the so-called roadmaps, how it goes on and on in the next uh, 10 years, uh, as they have been presented weeks ago at the chip design conference held every year in San Francisco. 
And this year, the engineer sounded rather pessimistic for the near future, let's say up to the year 2010. You're interested or should, should we rather more discuss uh, architectural issues after all? <laughs> <laughs> uh, as, 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 as the structures and the, as, as the, as the, as the uh, first, uh, Einstein's famous absolute speed of light or electricity under these uh, minim miniaturized uh, condition is far from being possible. The, trend, uh, the speed falls dramatically in these uh, smaller and smaller structures. And the, let's still, let's think once, one, one, one more time of water and, and, and these, in these very small um, channels of, or brooks or little rivers, the, the signals, the electrons behave not as points or molecules or zeros and ones anymore, that they become, once again, anal an an analog signals, waves traveling through waves that reflect themselves, that, 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 that become a kind of anti-digital material. If you imagine to build houses not out of stone or concrete, but uh, out of loam, out of, out of sand. If you imagine you would uh, make a Babylonian Mesopotamic uh, water system with absolutely uh, little structures and absolutely noisy sand, you could imagine how, 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 how leaking the whole system would become. And indeed, 80% uh, of all the electric power we put into our chips uh, nowadays into CPUs goes down leaking and is no energy useful at all and all the heating problems are leaking problems and finally there's a perspective that computers might be a sheer waste of energy and there's a possible damage ahead there auto destruction by uh, by, 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 by uh, the auto destruction as digital beings. If you remember still uh, Jorge Luis Borges' wonderful short story on the rig rigorousness of science, there was once a mythical empire whose topographical maps became better and better, and finally the geographers uh, succeeded in bringing up a map of the empire in the dimension of one to one. <laughs> and then, now think of computers as our uh, intellectual infrastructure, and then some uh, accident happened and science came into decline, and, and in, in, in the present stage, this is the end of Borges' uh, short story, only wolves and shackles have it last ruins of the map. So almost at the end of my lecture, I, I think I can safely prophesy the year when the exponential growth rate inherent to Moore's law will and must slow down. Otherwise, this world with all its energy and beauty would end up just as once in Malamé's ideal book in one gi gigantic and useless computer. In, slow th in, in system theory, the slowdown of exponential growth usually has a mathematical function grave of the so-called sigmoid. And as far as we can tell, every one's new technology that has changed or shaped a histor historical fate did finally take this rather harmless form. Before we had this exponential function and now I change to the sigmoid function which is also a a function dependent on E, on, on Euler's famous uh, number. First the formula. One divided by one plus E hope, min hope minus X. Which means that the function is 
0.5 at zero, that it is that it approximates one at the, in the positive part and it approximates zero in the negative part and this would be our computer present where growth rates are dramatically or not, let, let's say these were the her heroic times of the 80s and 90s and we are at this point of the of this graph of the, of the curve and a stable state some kind of a of a equilibrium will soon come uh, into our or my computerized mind thanks to the sigmoid but this doesn't mean that uh, under this stabilized uh, computer situation the feedback with microscopic effects would stop on the contrary I think um, now the miniaturization has been perfected and the rest of the world must be uh, subjected to this very principle of miniaturization or Americanization or how do, would you call it and to start with the most charming case um, it, it's no it's silly to speak about good and, and, and evil um, <laughs> this, 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 this routing or, or routing inside computers as you all know better than me can be expanded to the whole world and you know what globalization means computers are connected to other computers not users to users but computers to computers and, and, and this is really an amplification from this tiny world to the global world we know and now the charming um, example is more or less as far as I know Londonish and, and British one at least I learned it in Linz from British architects that uh, very early in the late 80s uh, London architect is, uh, discovered that houses and their eco ecologic behavior or buildings and their static properties can all be modeled by computer aided des design much better than by hand and and especially the ecologic uh, computation or simulation of of, of, of heat flow and of air flow and ev everything uh, is a wonderful possibility to connect this micro world to the big world of uh, the, the dog lands and so on and what I'm afraid to hear that in in New York some star architects in in difference to Sir Norman Foster, Foster um, just abuse their computers and their computer aided architectural programs and, the, and their young computer programmers uh, as if they were better slaves and I think that an architect who does not make or does or he or she doesn't make his or her personal experience with computer, this computer aided design uh, doesn't understand what's at stake you know that to come to the bad side other control or steering systems all can be subjected or connected to computer control a car an expensive car in, at least in Germany nowadays uh, includes about 150 embedded controllers which are all these little CPUs I try to describe you and everything in this car from uh, almost everything in this car is internally steered by computers and not, no more by the human driver and these cars are connected to streets and the streets are connected to sensors and the sensors are connected to traffic lights and this, all this is connected to monitors and especially in London town I think it's, it's worldwide the leading, uh, the leading city or metropole for control of people's behavior and so it, it's a rather interesting way of connecting microscopic and microscopic structures and the last my last, my really last point will be um, starting with you know, mm -hmm. 
how should I introduce it? It's, it's, I think it's important for all of us to get it clear. Um, all this monitoring and data mining and internet business and it's all uh, as if the outer macroscopic world would be the source and the computers would be the final train, the deep hole where everything else disappears. This is a very asymmetric situation which I really don't like. And so uh, it's nice to say at the end that this asymmetry tends to become obsolete why? Because the same manufacturing techniques which are used for use computers as more or less sensors of the outer world now can be applied to little mechanical devices on the, nanos, on the, on the nanos scale that are not sensors but effectors. So levers have been built which are only nanometers long cogwheels work and wheels go around in dimensions we can't even dream and medicines and military and, 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 and armies are very happy and I'm, I'm just happy because this asymmetry uh, goes away and, and, and computers began or computer, computer uh, controlled and, and directed nanomechanical tools uh, come into being and the world becomes a little bit more colorful. <laughs> and something is built which does something and not so something is built which only measures and reads something. And this is an architectural function, I think, to construct things that work, that, are, that work. Okay, yeah. thanks for listening. If, if, if time is left? Okay, it's sort of getting late, but... <clears throat> it's getting late. Uh, I think there should still be an opportunity, if anyone wants, uh, to ask Professor Kittler any questions. I really overdid your... Are there any questions? Ah, sorry, Brian. Was, was there, this is about the two clouds. Uh, was the Claude Channon uh, then responsible for introducing the Claude Levi Strauss the notion of entropy and entropology instead of anthropology? No, he wasn't re responsible, but I think a, a big mathematical inspiration for Levi Strauss. Uh, Shannon at the time was working on. Uh, Cryptoanalytic systems against the against the enemies of the USA and did a wonderful work and only I, I, I got it right your question. Brian? I got it right your question. Well, I mean, I, in all of this talk about information, uh -huh. uh, I and especially when you mentioned uh, Pynchon, yeah. of course, I I've been. The other side of information is entropy, and um, uh, Strauss, at some point, talks of, of anthropology, the practice of anthropology, is, uh, he, he puns on it and calls it entropology. Um, and um, I, it, it certainly occurs to me that perhaps there's a point at which he picked up this word in the sense of information theory. I'm not sure whether. Levi Strauss really read all this stuff. Uh, Shannon was pro prohibited to publish during the war and, and some three years after it. All, all, all these works on information theory and uh, information theory of secrecy systems uh, were declassified by the Pentagon end of the end of the 40s and not before. And they and they stayed in the same uh, house uh, during the war. And so this can't this can have been only informal discussions with. And on, on Shannon's side, very, uh, very cautious discussions. He couldn't reveal what he did, really. So I don't think that uh, Claude Levi Strauss got a real introduction into information theory. That's a question. So, 
comment that notion of uh, or strategy of the chip makers to offer an ocean of gates, yeah. and then you moved on to discuss uh, um, the distinction between a kind of non-hierarchical, let's say, mm -hmm. array of, of, of gates and then a certain uh, layered or st hierarchically structured system. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't quite understand what is the current strategy within chip making. The second one, uh -huh, okay. the, the hierarchical one, my English left me, uh, left me from time to time, I'm so sorry, and I overtook your patience, I fear. Uh, but uh, now, we, as a Unix fanatic, <laughs> I, I might say that uh, now, now we are really through with uh, soft, uh, with free software. This has been done, and uh, every, 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 every boy in, in the industry knows we are, we are cheaper than Microsoft Corporation and better. Uh, and, and, and now there has really arisen the idea, uh, after we've made uh, free software, now let's do free hardware. And this is, is, is discussed in the net. And then uh, oceans of, of gates will be totally welcome. No? The structure is developed by the community. A, a, new, a new architecture for running uh, central processing unit, CPU. And the sea of gates will be informed by us. And these are cheap, these oceans of gates. See. SOTs, seas of transistors. And, and so I think this is the connection between the political option and the mm, engineering one is striking. No? Hierarchy in the one case and, and open software or, or hardware and, and democracy, if you like, between transistors, democracy between transistors, I say for the first and last time in my life. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I oh. think probably uh, we ought to end there. Um, I would very much, on your behalf, uh, like to thank Professor Kittler uh, for his talk this evening. And I think we sort of look forward to him coming back again. Thank you very much indeed.